Thank you, Alyssa. It's uh, really an honor to be here, and it's especially uh, a joy to to see Alyssa as a professor here and leading this program um, that that really means so much. And I'll talk more about Alyssa in in this talk, but I'm going to share with you uh, some of the research that we've done in sustainable systems and pull some lessons from it and share the framework we developed uh, in sustainable systems with a big focus on accelerating climate solutions, the clean energy transition. And I was asked to start with a little bit of a background on my career. So you could see um, it's very interdisciplinary and very diverse. So I actually started with chemistry and chemical engineering a joint program. Um, then I took off from the university for a year to uh, be a biochemist. I was in a biochemical engineering program and I studied muscular dystrophy and I was thinking about going that route, but I got contacted by the chair of our chemical engineering department to join a new program, a NIOSH traineeship with the School of Public Health, Environmental Health Sciences. And I had to decide, do I stay in the medical track, branch, or go to environment, and gave it some thought, and really um, glad I pursued environment. Uh, and I got my PhD in chemical engineering, studied how PCBs move in the environment, kind of uh, sorption modeling, experimental work, and that was great. Um, but I was really interested in bigger things than just looking at how pollution moves around in the environment. And I got a, a postdoc position. Um, and I started on waste reduction and recognized you really need to look upstream at how products are designed. So I discovered sort of the life cycle system back in the early uh, 89, I guess, and started doing life cycle modeling. And at that time, there were only a few folks doing life cycle modeling. And now it's like a huge field. Uh, and I continued on and I actually was in the Transportation Research Institute and was in a research track. Um, in our school, and then a professorship opened up and applied. And uh, but I will point out, just in terms of my career, the engineering, the chemical engineering, was very instrumental in uh, my career. And particularly, there was a, cor a couple of courses I took in mathematical modeling uh, that really gave me a foundation for what I'm doing now. And uh, this professor would come into the room with some experiment. He'd have a cup of hot water. He'd drop an, uh, like really hot water, drop an ice cube in it, and he'd say, model how many times that ice cube flips before it completely melts. And that's an example of what we had to model. Or here's a coffee pot or a coffee maker. Model the concentration of the coffee over time. And these were wicked problems, but it was great because I really learned how to define a problem in terms of defining the system and setting up the constitutive equations and everything, and that, that really shaped my career. Um, and I'll tell you more about it, but just that's my sort of academic background. And then early on, I was a, that's actually me, um, same person, uh, back in 91. Um, I was, you know, postdoc, just starting looking for uh, funding, and there was this RFP came out to establish a center, a uh, pollution prevention center. And so we actually won the award. It was a, a competition, and we put forward the life cycle framework. It wasn't just preventing pollution going from one media to another, but really looking at the system of production, consumption, end of life. And uh, we just celebrated our, uh, actually, this was the 25th uh, anniversary where Gina McCarthy, administrator, congratulated us, but we have also celebrated our 30th anniversary. And our center, actually, I should back up. Our center was really about integrating pollution prevention into the curriculum, um, chemical engineering, accounting, law. And so we had all these different um, resources to help bring it into the curriculum. So I really learned a lot about pollution prevention, sustainability from different disciplinary perspectives and tools. But it was supposed to be a three-year center and the administrator really liked what we were doing and so extended it, but we recognized that wasn't gonna be a long-term 
uh, enterprise for us. So we transitioned to the Center for Sustainable Systems. We coined the term sustainable systems back in 97. People thought we were crazy, sustainable systems. I'll tell you more about that. But our mission is really bringing system science for climate action and a sustainable society, just and sustainable society. Um, we started out with just a couple of faculty and we've expanded. We have core staff, but we've partnered on projects with over 100 uh, faculty across the campus. And what's really special about what we've done and accomplished is really the training of faculty, researchers, other alumni that are elsewhere doing great things. And I'm highlighting one here, Alyssa, and I'll talk a little bit more about her research, but incredible in terms of what she accomplished in terms of integrating models and applying it to sustainable infrastructure. And I was looking at, back at her accomplishments because if you go to our website, it shows how many publications each of the staff produced. And there were 16 from her master's and doctoral research. I mean, I, it is, I think it's one of the top and we have you know, faculty, these are faculty in the U.S., international. These are uh, graduates at national labs. And, uh, yeah, you have a real special person here uh, in, at Davis. So I just wanted to point that out. And now on to sustainable systems. What's our vision for it or what was our framework? It's pretty, this is pretty basic, but this is what we put forward years ago. Um, and it starts what, with needs of populations. Um, those needs are you know, looking at shelter and sustenance and mobility. Um, and then you have production and consumption activities to meet needs that drives material and energy flows that ultimately impact the life support system. And as you know, you know, our population is still growing, which puts pressure on this. Um, in terms of needs, uh, we have many unmet needs in terms of populations, communities, disadvantaged communities. So we're nowhere near sustainability because until those get met. And then, of course, what's driving things are our consumption patterns. And we know some of those are out of line, particularly uh, in developed countries. Um, and this, in terms of the life support system of the planet, it's about resources and the ecosystem services that it provides. And ultimately, it is really defining our caring capacity, our well-being, right, our health. And we all know this is a problem, right? We're exceeding thresholds in terms of the pressure this is applying. And, you know, back then we said that a sustainable system is one that's human designed and where you have ecological processes for meeting needs while maintaining the long-term integrity of the life supports uh, system of the planet and lofty definition, but it, you know, then comes down to metrics. And what we're trying to do here is accelerate with our center and looking at sustainable systems is high impact sustainability transformations. And you transform a system like going from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. I mean, that's one mode of mobility. There's bicycles, there's, you know, mass transit, which I, Holy, you know, think we need to do much more. But anyway, this is one transition. And the levers are the technology, the design, the enterprises. You need policy. You need the markets to send the right signals. And it's about people's values and behavior. So we are focused on the systems analysis to inform these levers. And it really requires alignment of the technology the policy, the markets, and the behavior to accelerate this transformation, right? And so it is very interdisciplinary. Um, we do these life cycle models, um, but you really need models of all these other systems to be effective in accelerating transformations. So it is about the integration to characterize interactions between technology, policy, markets, behavior. We do that by measuring across space and time the performance, lucidating trade-offs, and informing and guiding stakeholder decision-making. We emphasize you got to look across scale, multi-objective, there's multi-stakeholders, um, ideally you're co-creating solutions. 
very interdisciplinary. And those are just some of the disciplines. I focused on life cycle tools of assessment, cost analysis, design optimization. This is valuable because you're looking at production and consumption. You can map to stakeholders in the life cycle supply chain. You can define a wide set of metrics, look at interdependencies, and you can also then highlight the opportunities for improvement. And we've studied a variety of systems that, as Alyssa's indicated, I'll talk about some of these uh, today. Um, and just, I think you know about this uh, in terms of the problem, in terms of why we need to accelerate clean energy transitions. You know, we need to cut our emissions in half by 2030, and we're way off course. We're not on track. There's a huge disparity in terms of what we emit versus world average and where we need to go in terms of IPCC climate target. So just to orient, um, I started out here with, in a typical, in an average household in the United States, where does, where do, how do we spend money? And you could see 12% is food, 34% is housing, 16% is transportation. And then if you look at greenhouse gas emissions, you could see you know, food kind of aligns, but transportation gets a lot bigger and housing, you know, shrinks a bit uh, compared to where we spend. So it's important to understand, and this is kind of an average annual household spend of $67,000. And it's important to understand that when you're talking about transitions and talking about, you know, more efficient appliances, electric vehicles, that's very difficult to manage with that kind of a budget. But I like this just in terms of, we've done a lot of our work focuses on transportation, <laughs> emphasis here on transportation, uh, you could see because it drives a lot of the impact. And this industrial also is, in terms of producing vehicles, materials, will really make transportation even bigger. And we focused on a lot on light duty vehicles, which is about 60% of the transportation burden. We're, we're also looking at heavy duty and getting into um, aircraft and rail with regard to uh, our hydrogen research. Electrification has been a key strategy, um, but for certain applications like medium and heavy duty, marine aircraft, hydrogen can play a role. So those of you that haven't had life cycle assessment, here's your one slide course. So this is a generic diagram starting out with acquisition of materials. You process those into think engineered materials like plastics and steel, aluminum. Fabricate into parts, produce a product, it gets used, goes into service. Um, eventually there's retirement. You try to recover materials through remanufacturing, recycling. Um, and you have disposal. We draw boundaries around the system. We then model the flows in and out. And we create a profile of this product to see how impacts distribute across the life cycle. So it, it really provides a basis and framework for measuring environmental sustainability performance and seeing where the opportunities are for improvement. And we did a study, one of the first studies, comprehensive studies of a car where we had 20,000 parts and components and had to break it down systematically starting with an assembly plant and then going to all the systems of the vehicle, like the powertrain, breaking those down, eventually going to the materials that go into uh, that particular part or component and collecting data from each of those. So it took us three years to model that, and here's the result. So you get this profile where 90% of the energy or 85% of the energy is in the use phase of the vehicle. Um, here's the materials, here's manufacturing, and you could use this, and we work with these material suppliers, work with these autos, um, the OEMs, materials pr suppliers provided data on the materials, but we had to then figure out, you know, the specific types of materials going into each of the different parts. So it was a huge enterprise and activity, but you use this to look at improvement. So if I switched from a steel body vehicle to an aluminum body vehicle, I'm going to ask you a question. How does that profile change? 
So instead of steel here, I make the car out of aluminum. What will happen to that first bar? It's going to go up or is it going to go down, do you think? Go down. I got I got I okay. I <laughs> well, aluminum is more energy intensive than steel, so it actually goes up. What happens to the use phase? It goes down, exactly. Because you're lightweighting the vehicle. This framework allows you to then look at the overall impact. And then it depends on how, you know, what's the distance or the service life of the vehicle. Well, because if if the vehicle crashes after two years, definitely the aluminum is going to lose, right? Because you just brought this up and you're not getting that much gain. So we've, we've modeled all of that. And we then went from an internal combustion engine vehicle to alternative vehicles. So one of the first studies, which was through a U.S. Uh, DOE um, China Center, modeled a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and an electric vehicle. So this was kind of like a volt. And this is the total greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle. This axis is how much driving is in electric mode. So here is all gas. So those are your life cycle emissions. Over here is all electric. And you can see the lines that are colored correspond to different regions of the country in terms of where we're charging. And you could see, and we also have the dash line of China. But you could see these regions here, emissions actually went up with this PHEV. What is in the grid that's driving those lines to go up? Exactly right. Okay, so um, yeah, it's, and this is the, the leaf. So that was some of our early work in PHEVs. There's China. Then more recently, we did a study looking at BEVs, all electric vehicles, and this was with Ford. And we modeled the grid uh, temperature effects because colder temperatures, the vehicles aren't as efficient. Um, we looked at changes in the grid. So now you're, you're looking at purchasing a vehicle today. The grid is evolving. It's you know, decarbonizing. You're modeling that. Um, and we used uh, GREET, Argonne's GREET model, which is actually a lot of the modules in it originally came out of our life cycle work at our center of that first uh, mid-sized vehicle. There's also a tool, I don't know if you've been introduced to Cambian, which is to model the grid into the future, so we use that. And an interesting finding is the production of the vehicle, here's the internal combustion, hybrid electric, battery electric, just production, you could see greenhouse gas emissions almost double. So you could say, well, how is this going to help with decarbonization? We've doubled the emissions, and that's really due to the batteries, and that's across sedans, SUVs, and pickups. But um, you get payback in two years, and that's because of the use phase, um, even with the current grid. And we found across these transitions you see a 57% lower greenhouse gas emissions for the electric vehicle, battery electric vehicle, compared to the internal combustion engine vehicle. So if this is 100%, the pickup, and we're working with Ford, they're interested in pickups, um, you go down to 45%. And across the board, it's pretty much 50, you know, over 50% reduction this way. Now, really, you're going to get the best benefit if you get the pickup driver who doesn't use their pickup at all for carrying things to switch to a sedan, right? So, you know, behavior is important. This is where the biggest gain is, but there's a gain here. And actually you reduce more tonnage with this transition than with this transition, 62 tons versus 40 tons. Is there a question? Yeah, please. For the model, for two parts, but one can be, and there's tons of different styles, right? There's like mid, mid-level electrification, high. Right. Which ones do we do different, different Cambian scenarios and then app? No, we, we, we have the different scenarios in there, but we, this is like mid scenario. And, but we looked at those different. Yeah. And for the batteries, 
is it all the same battery chemistry? Yeah, we, we, is there yeah. a difference in emissions based on cap? There's definitely differences, and we looked at um, it wasn't the lithium iron phosphate uh, chemistry, but it was a, another lithium chemistry. But we, we also then did uh, scenario analysis looking at um, improvements in terms of efficiency of the batteries as well. So those are all very important. And when you're doing this kind of modeling, you want to explore, you know, you saw that that impact was quite high in the production of the battery. So then you want to look at factors like efficiency in production, changing the grid for manufacturing. Um, it, you know, those are all going to affect the future in terms of trajectory because we've been optimizing with internal combustion. And you'll see a little bit later, we, we did look at the actual change of the car park over time and are we going to meet targets with carbon so I'll, I'll show you that in a bit so there's the payback within a couple of years um, with these vehicles and then we did maps so you know here's more intensity less intensity and you could see we you know we're going more blue going from red to blue um, this isn't a political map this is a ghg map but um, most all counties um, show a reduction in emissions. We then looked at justice issues, and we, we uh, focused particularly on the cost of fueling of vehicles and looking at something we call the transportation energy burden. So percentage of your household income that goes to fueling your vehicle, either gasoline or electricity for charging. And this is current vehicles on the road and a map of what their burdens are. National average is 3.6%. If you're above 4%, it's considered a high threshold. If you go to a new internal combustion engine vehicle, it drops down between 2.3 and 3.4, depending on your vehicle type. If you go to a BEV, you're down to 1.4 to 2%. So an improvement. But if we look at disadvantaged communities, and so this is the area medium income, we're over here, and you can see we're still above 4%. So this is not going to solve the justice problem or the energy burden problem. There are just a lot of households that still will have a high burden. Now it's an improvement, and this is just the use phase. We're doing work now on the total cost of ownership and looking at used vehicles as well. Um, but it is a challenge. So addressing underserved communities in terms of, you know, this will help bring down cost of operation. You got to look at the cost of purchasing a vehicle, and you also need to look at infrastructure. But yeah, that map, you could see very high burdens across the country for many households. So we did, we're about to, close to publishing, um, study on the total cost of ownership and there's been many studies of the total cost of ownership and this is a map of these previous studies and we tried to be very comprehensive so looking at initial costs the vehicle the infrastructure the fueling insurance all these various parameters and what we find is that going from BEV to ICEV it's a lower total cost of ownership um, but light duty trucks still uh, higher in terms of the total cost of ownership. And some significant differences across the uh, 14 cities we analyzed. And things like insurance were big factors in New York City and Detroit. Um, home charging has a big advantage over public charging. Um, 10,000 on average difference up to 26,000. And we're now looking at used total cost of ownership because 70% of vehicle purchases are used vehicles. So you wanna look at, well, what, what's affordability? What's the best period of ownership of these vehicles to keep your cost down? We've done work on autonomous vehicles. Um, so they get tested at M City. You guys should come visit M City. Um, so here we start out with a non 
connected autonomous vehicle its life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions. You add the equipment, um, so you're adding weight to the vehicle, you're adding drag to the vehicle, uh, computing power, so this goes up. So here's your CAV, but you have advantages in terms of platooning, eco-driving, and intersection connectivity that bring this down. And so we found um, you know, about a 9%, up to 9% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions with this connected autonomous vehicle. But this is just looking at the vehicle subsystems and vehicle effects. So Tom Stevens, a graduate of our program, um, he actually came in with a PhD. He wanted to retool in sustainability and got a master's degree. Then, and this is after being at a national lab, then he went to Argonne and he led an interagency study to look at the broader mobility effects on fuel consumption. And he pulled together all these studies and put them into models and found you could get an overall reduction of 60% in fuel consumption, but you could also find on the other extreme, a 200% increase in fuel consumption. And this is due to um, you know, easier trans, uh, travel, so you make it easier to travel so you could live further away from work. Um, you have more uh, people served, now that's positive. Um, but really looking at the system effects is important, right? Um, how that changes patterns of development, so it's important to not only look at the, you know, the, the vehicle system, but also the broader mobility system and its effects. We also did a study with Ford on flying cars. Okay, I, I grew up watching the Jetsons. That's probably, I don't know if they show Jetson reruns, but you know, years later I'm modeling it. And uh, this was interesting because it takes a lot of energy to lift off the ground and you could say it's a loser. Well, we found that for certain applications, if you're fully loaded with a e, um, the VTOL, vertical t takeoff and landing vehicle that's electric, and comparing it to a typical load in terms of a ground vehicle, like 1.5 passengers, there are certain applications of certain distance where the VTOL could outperform. Um, and it also, you could look at if you have a circuitous route and you could go straight with the VTOL, um, but it's, it's limited. And we were not sort of advocating this. We were just studying it to see the effects. Um, and, you know, personally, I'm not a fan of, of these. Um, I think we need to put the energy into, you know, mass transit. Um, they're really not going to have a big role in terms of a, a decarbonization solution. Now comes to an infrastructure study uh, that Alyssa was really the lead in, in making all this happen. And so uh, there's, a, there's a collaborator in civil and environmental engineering that was developing a new concrete, engineered cementaceous composites, which are bendable. Concrete is very brittle. So we developed this integrated design framework where he is working on microstructure tailoring of the concrete material. So he's looking at it at a, at a nanoscale, engineering it to give you better properties. Those properties then go into infrastructure applications. And we modeled, and Alyssa led this, modeled the infrastructure, and she focused on a bridge deck where this material would be deployed. And looking over the life of the bridge deck, determined the impacts on greenhouse gas emissions, energy, and cost, and fed that back to guide the design of the material at the nano scale. And a challenging model, because you're having to, one, look at the service life of this material and its rehabilitation. So when does it get repaired, re rehabilitated? Um, what happens when you have a reconstruction event? they get the cones out. So they get the cones out, you get a backup of traffic. You get a backup of traffic, you have more pollution. She had to model how the vehicles change over time and their, you know, their fuel economy changing over time, their emissions. So a traffic congestion model, 
a model on the materials and the infrastructure and collaborated with uh, another student who, you know, we, we went to him and said, okay, you're the civil engineer. Tell us how this material is going to behave so we can model it. Uh, Mike Lepic, he's, he's at Stanford, uh, you know, doing engineering, but um, incredible study. And what we found, amazing results, this material is more energy intensive and carbon intensive than concrete. So kind of like the electric vehicle, you could say out of the gate, it's a loser. But over the life cycle, you could see a benefit. Um, so the materials um, actually were lower in impact, even though on a per volume basis, they were worse. But over the life cycle, they're more durable. So this impact is lower, but really dwarfs things is the back of, of, of traffic. So with conventional, you have more rehabilitation events, reconstruction events, you're backing up traffic. That dwarfs the impact of the material. So Alyssa did develop this model, did integrated costs and environment, um, environmental performance models, and some 16 papers, not just this, she also worked on other things with cement and uh, yeah, but a, a, a great study. And then we went and looked at pavements and used this for uh, an optimized. Um, so a lot with, with that work and got into charging infrastructure and went to optimize to charge vehicles. Um, from there, we took on the postal service so the Postal Service only wanted to electrify 10% of their vehicles. And they cited a life cycle study showing that the, the benefits aren't there. So we reviewed their study and they overestimated the benefits of the gas vehicles and underestimated the benefits of the electric vehicles. So we published this, critiqued it, um, and now they are gonna be deploying more electric vehicles. But this example where you can contribute to um, affecting, you know, policy and, uh, you know, investment by government because they're investing in this fleet. It's going to be around for, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, very important, you know, to bring good science to inform decision making. We've looked at wireless charging. So basically, um, wireless charging is where you have inductive charging. You either have uh, stationary or dynamic, but we looked at a bus fleet in Ann Arbor, where to place the uh, infrastructure for charging at bus stops, which stops get most utilized. Advantages of this are you could light weight the vehicle um, because you could reduce the battery size, get better fuel economy, um, and found that there are advantages in terms of, of, of this compared to, you know, conventional. We then looked at dynamic charging. So this is in ripping up a whole road infrastructure, putting in the charging. We used Alyssa's models to figure out, okay, which roads do you rip up? So you look at their health and you got to coordinate, um, you know, taking out a certain stretch or segment of road and putting it in the infrastructure and you gotta make it so it's continuous and works. This is pretty tough, you could imagine. And, and you have to have a high penetration of these vehicles to make it, make it work. This was a project where I sat down with a doctoral student and I asked, when should I replace my vehicle? It, it wasn't quite this bad, but um, because you think, well, you should hold on to your vehicle, right? That's what we all often think is extend the service life. So I sat down and uh, Chul Kim developed a model on working with industrial engineering where you have a defender, an existing vehicle and a challenger. And the defender is existing, but it's inefficient. The challenger is more efficient, but you create burdens in producing the challenger. So you get this trade-off. So you take, you have to model every year of the vehicle and pr produce using LCA and cost an optimization model that characterizes the energy emissions and cost. And then you set an objective, you set, you simulate, you have objective functions 
that say you want to minimize energy or greenhouse gas emissions or cost, and you run this optimization model and you get a policy out. And so what you're doing is you're starting out with a, a vehicle, you're driving it, and then you could either keep driving it and end up over here or switch. And so you look at all the different permutations and you come up with this kind of result. At the time, fuel economy was very flat. So it's wait like 15 years before switching out your vehicle. With these pollutant emissions, criteria pollutant emissions is change out your vehicle to minimize over this time horizon. So I'm gonna ask you why the difference in policy here between these pollutants and CO2 energy and cost. Like catalytic. Very good. So these emissions were going down. Even though you create emissions in making a new vehicle, significant reductions by replacing with the new vehicle because they were really driving down tailpipe emissions. Whereas here, fuel economy is pretty flat. Hold on to it. And in our household where I grew up, my dad was a CPA. Okay. We held on to our cars, you know, 15 years old, you know, the wheels would fall off and then it's time to change the vehicle. So I got a half million dollar grant from NSF to prove that my dad was right, you know, that I hated to see that, but he was, he was right. So we've used this model actually to inform a lot of replacement policy with different systems. This is looking at behavior and opportunities to, to reduce energy use in a household. And this was Kevin Bolin, where he took National Household Travel Survey data, which describes how households use their vehicles. So it looks at all the vehicles in the household, their trips, how many people were in the vehicle, what was their stop time, their end time, destination. And he, he modeled all that. And um, so these are the different trip uh, segments. And then what he did was look at how could I better assign the vehicles in the households to trips and meet those needs. So instead of taking the SUV to commute to work, you would take the sedan, right? But if you have the, a trip with, you know, six passengers and you, you would use the SUV if you need that space. So by doing that, just by assigning the trips um, to vehicles more effectively, he could reduce emissions by five to 20 some percent. Then you could still, you could take this model further and say, well, which vehicle should I take out of the fleet and what should I substitute it with? And we were trying to engage dealerships to say, well, you could advise your customers on which vehicles would be best for their needs. Now, how far do you think that went, that conversation? Yeah, no, it didn't go very far, but maybe someday they'll get there. But anyway, this was an interesting study. How many of you have seen this equation? So pretty much everybody. How many of you are technology optimists? A little reluctance, right? But I, I think you all know about IP, A, and T. What we did is actually operationalize it to look at gasoline consumption in the United States between 1970 and 2018. Gas consumption went up 56%. Population increased 60%, so that's driving it. DMT per capita went up 74%, so that's your A term. Fuel economy, so... Um, it went from 13 miles per gallon on road to 23. So that's the T term, right? Gallons per mile is the reciprocal of that. This went down 44%, but clearly not enough. So here's the technology optimist, right? Not enough to overcome population growth and increases in consumption, right? So in this case, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to update this because we are really starting to move on this one and we could look at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but very important to look at what technology could do, what behavior can do, and then you know, put vehicles in a global context, 
And I could show you a graph of, you know, number of vehicles in China going up. We're close to a vehicle per person in the United States, and that includes babies and, you know, people that, you know, can't drive anymore, uh, that are older. So um, I think this is a very powerful equation from um, John Holdren uh, and Ehrlich, one of the uh, physicists and ecologists put this together and, uh, and, and very important to look at. And just related to that, I wanna ask you the question, which mode of transportation is most efficient? Bicycle? Train? Okay, well, you have to define that. How would you define it? Talking car, but didn't say walking. You're, you're, the walking and the bicycle is going to work, and I don't even have results on that, but that, that's clearly going to be you know, the best option in terms of lower impact. In terms of performance, it might take you for me to get back home in Ann Arbor. The walking, biking might be a little tough, but... Where's the chart there, girls? Huh? Right, right. So here's some results, and here the metric I'm using is BTUs per passenger mile. And here's our transit bus, which I ride periodically when it's raining or something or snow when I'm not riding my bicycle. It's a loser. Why is it a loser? Because they're riding MD. Right. What do you think these numbers represent? The vehicle, very good, the average occupancy. So this bus, which could hold 30, 40 passengers, on average is about 7.7. .7. You know, and flying over here, it was packed, right? Which is good. Um, so behavior is huge with all this. And, you know, I say, well, I shouldn't ride the bus, right? Because it's a loser. Well, obviously, it's even going to get worse in terms of occupancy, um, but we clearly need to address behavior in, in, in terms of this clean energy transition. So one of the things we looked at is how are we doing with regard to the EV transition in terms of meeting IPCC goals for carbon reduction? And so we looked at um, grid emissions intensity by state uh, and different scenarios in terms of of aggressiveness of decarbonization, but the aspirational target to hit a 50% reduction was 800 um, million tons of CO2 by 2030, which is this line here. And these scenarios, we are falling short. So the light duty fleet with a 95% decarbonization, and this is with 50% sales by 2030, which is administrative administration goals, um, we approach, well, in 20, uh, 2035, we actually approach a 45% reduction. By 2030, we are very short. Um, and this is one of the easiest sectors to decarbonize, and, and just we're not on track. So you, we, we all need to do more, right? Um, I hate to be gloom and doom, but it's you know, we're not on track. And this is just, you know, demonstrating with the models, even in some cases with aggressive goals, we're not there. The good news is we're pretty close, you know, by 2035. But we got to meet those targets with regard to sales or we got to, you know, do much more with mass transit and other means. The other thing we looked at early on is, is there enough lithium with this transition? And so we worked with a geologist, uh, Steve Kessler, who Alyssa worked with quite a bit on cement um, in terms of limestone resources. And we did find that with recycling, there's enough lithium over 100 years. Now, you should hear from Alyssa because she's done a lot more work on supply chains of lithium and a lot more sophisticated, detailed models of how it's produced, where, and, um, but you gotta look at, you know, there's a transition with electric vehicles. There's huge impacts with mining of lithium. It takes a lot of water. Um, it's in areas where it's putting stress on agricultural production. 
Uh, and so it's so one bottom line is you saw the different vehicle types. We got to match up the right vehicles with the needs. You don't need a, a, a Hummer with, you know, 300 mile range, you know, to get to work, right? That's just putting much more stress on the system in terms of supply. Uh, and so this is the big picture in terms of sustainable systems. In terms of the hydrogen ecosystem, so Alyssa mentioned where we have this My Hydrogen initiative. And here there's an opportunity for hydrogen to play a role with decarbonizing certain sectors that are difficult to decarbonize through electricity. And some of those include transportation. Um, then there's various industries, uh, am ammonia production, some uh, steel production, um, low process heat for, for certain industries where hydrogen can play a role. Um, it's interesting with regard to scenarios where they're looking at hydrogen, um, a majority of hydrogen or the largest fraction of hydrogen that goes into petroleum refining. So looking at the future, there are studies where they're looking at what are the needs in 2050 for petroleum refining, and they actually have us using more petroleum than we're using today. And it's like, this: how is this going to add up with net zero, right? So we're doing a critical review and we're finding, you know, you really need to show less petroleum products. It's not zero. We use petroleum products in the, in the chemical industry, right? But these are uh, very interesting. Uh, this is a whole new area, hydrogen ecosystems, figuring out where to site, production, what end uses. And I understand that we just found out today that we were awarded one of these hydrogen hubs, a billion dollars. This is a Midwest hub, and we were one of the hubs selected. And I understand California, which UC Davis is involved in, also won. You, yours might have been 1.2 million, I don't know, or billion, I don't know. But anyway, they won one of the hubs. There's, I think, six, seven awarded. Okay, that makes sense. It was like $7 billion total. So, Quickly looking at, we did some work on light duty vehicles for you to understand why doesn't it make sense. So if you took renewable electricity to charge a battery, you lose a little bit T and D loss, charging loss, but very efficient in terms of getting the energy to the motor to deliver one megajoule to the wheels. If you deliver one megajoule to the wheels with hydrogen, it takes 4.5 megajoules of electricity. You lose it in electrolysis, splitting water, um, and then you lose it back. So you do this to make hydrogen, and then you take hydrogen to feed it into a fuel cell to make electricity again. So, you know, you could be a music student and be able to answer the question, which one of these is, is better, right? Um, you don't, have to be an energy and well it, it took a lot to put this together but it shows you know that you get electricity back and it's just not going to win out now where this is important is where you get to heavy loads that the batteries are going to be so large that you really need to look at other options where are we on time okay and what are we Okay, okay, I'm not, not too far off. <laughs> I wanna switch to residential buildings. So here we did one of the early studies of a mid-sized house, a comprehensive model of all the components that go into producing a house and over its life. And we found that you know the mass of the house went up, um, but the energy and emissions were cut by two thirds. And what we did is we just took the house and we took existing technologies of efficiency and adding insulation and things like that and could achieve this reduction. We also did the life cycle cost. So this was the mortgage. Um, well, the price of the house was 340000 for a standard home. The efficient home was 370000 But you could see the utilities 
shrunk down dramatically, right? Over the life cycle, you know, some advantage. Problem with this scenario is this is over 50 years. People move or households change over on average like seven years, right? So to get this these small benefits back, you know, you got to be in the house a long time. We went to the home builder and he gave us data, very cooperative, but we said, we showed the efficient design and said, well, are you interested in, you know, building these efficient houses? And what do you think his answer was back then? Why? Strength. More expensive. More expensive, which means what? He's going to sell less homes, right? So, but there are, there's a whole industry now for, you know, green construction. But back then it was, you know, it was tough. Um, this slide plus the one about uh, the bridge where you have more upfront emissions or um, more upfront embodied emissions of material. Similarly for this, you have more mass in the home, which means you, have, you would presume. Yep, they actually, the, the energy went up a bit in the efficient, okay? Like a through line, and similar with EVs, right? There's more upfront, like you're internalizing carbon emissions in the production of the thing versus externalizing those emissions, thinking of like internal external costs. Right, right. So it seems like there's kind of like this intuitive through line to do a lot of different things. How do you think about that in terms of folks are saying embodied emissions bad, like find the least, you know, least carbon intensive material to build a building, right? Like we want to do that, right? It's good to do, but there's sometimes it's like, well, no, actually we want to spend a little bit. Right. It's going to have a longer service life or provide more insulation benefit about that broadly is that like a i guess is that like rule was that like a feels like it's almost like you're bridging like this rule of like and like internally next internalizing and externalizing emissions you actually want to internalize emissions because you could in theory capture some of those emissions or this point source or something like that and some half-baked idea well what it no it's what you're saying is really you need to look at the life cycle Right, and you could simulate the life cycle. You simulate the behavior. You simulate what happens to the grid, and see where does it come out. And yes, maybe your emissions do go up in the construction of the home, but as we move, we know we're moving in this direction, right? As we shift in terms of our grid, as we go from natural burning natural gas, which which I'm doing right now. I mean, I have an electric oven, but we got this nice gas range, which is, you know, I, I actually asked Whirlpool, could we, a kitchen aid, could we, you know, convert the top to an induction? But, you know, what the answer to that is. Um, but anyway, as we shift to low carbon in terms of the fuels and sources, the carriers coming in, this is going to go down. So then the focus is about the the embodied emissions. The other thing to, to recognize, though, is that the electricity, renewable electricity, is not free. We don't have an infinite renewable electricity. You need to look at the total energy requirements. It's not, well, this is energy, but if you're looking at GHG, it's this is not just all about getting to zero. It's like, how much energy are you using? So we've done a lot of research, for example, with carbon capture and utilization. You know, you, you if you have renewable electricity, you could do a lot of things. You go against thermodynamics and you can make, you know, a green material or chemical. But that renewable electricity is not free and we could take that electricity and put it in the grid and do better things in terms of carbon reduction than putting it into some of these CCU technologies. So we have to look at both the energy side in terms of renewable, you know, energy to do this but also, yes, look at what happens with, you know, the materials. And as we shift to electric vehicles, it is going to be more about the material production 
impacts. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's it's really a life cycle frame. Okay, so yeah, I actually I took out some slides on. So one of the things we did is develop principles for certain things, like principles for um, grid storage, principles for electric vehicles storage, principles for light weighting. So there's life cycle tools to measure performance, right? But people can't, you know, if you're designing something new, it's hard to come up with a life cycle answer. So you develop rules, like rules with energy storage for utilities is you charge clean, displace dirty. You know, there's certain things that, you know, can help guide planning and decision making. And I think that's what you're getting at here, trying to come up with some general guidance. Yeah, I'm kind of getting at the general, like, pretty cliche. It was like, yo, what is it? Buy nice or buy twice kind of thing. Right. Right. But some of these things are very nuanced and complicated. Like I talked about, you know, extending service life. Well, you don't want to extend it indefinitely because there's better technology that you want to adopt, right? So these, these all have to be taken into account. And, you know, we have these trends of consumption patterns where, um, you know, we're increasing in home size, but occupancy is going down. So, again, I keep coming back to behavior and the iPad equation is very important. And you could go inside the house. So we did this optimal replacement for refrigerators. And now we see that these don't all align. Like here's cost is kind of where people replace. But from an energy point of view and GHG, you should be replacing more frequently. And that's because of standards on refrigerators. And this gets really complicated because you have the energy usage going up over time um, because your insulation isn't as effective. In terms of changing out here, you have different refrigerants that were put in place. And so all this you know, had to be modeled in terms of optimal replacement. We did this for light bulbs, um, and uh, you know, there it's like some people think, well, you wait for your bulb to burn out incandescent before you replace it. No, in my class, what I do is I take, I take an incandescent bulb and I and I have a hammer and I say, this is what you need to do is replace it immediately because you save money and uh, cost. This was a complicated study, just how you wash your dishes, you know, something basic. You got to look at, you know, your techniques, you know, the dishwasher, but you have for manual washing, some people run the tap. So we have um, at Thanksgiving relatives that come over and help wash the dishes and they got the tap running, you know, full blast. And we actually years ago got a dishwasher just for that purpose. Um, but there's a two basin method where you fill a basin up to, to wash, another basin where you rinse, and then actually it could outperform the dishwasher. Dishwasher needs to be fully loaded. The dishwasher, the other thing is um, you deselect heated dry. Um, and a lot of people wash their dishes before they put them in a dishwasher. So again, you're, you're countering. <laughs> And there was a study, you know, just, yeah. So it's very interesting. Then you need to look at how are you heating your water? Are you using natural gas, using electricity? What's the grid? These things get very complicated. But then you want to, you know, so we get involved in, you know, sharing this information. And, you know, since this study, I've probably done several interviews with reporters about how to wash your dishes because you want to get the word out, you know, to consumers. One thing we did is analyze LEED. You're probably familiar with LEED buildings and the certification um, system. Uh, the purpose of this was to be able to provide an objective means of evaluating um, building performance. Our hypothesis was that these points are well balanced. And so what we did is we took a building we then applied life cycle modeling to figure out the burdens. We then looked at lead to figure out what credits you would get for doing certain strategies. And then we looked at burdens for credit on an energy basis. And we said they should be 
even. Like if I use this, these points to reduce energy and save energy by X, I should get the same kind of burden per credit. And uh, that wasn't quite the case. So this is burdens in terms of energy per credit. And depending on what you're doing, um, very different results. And we did this study with the US Green, um, well, we did this study was supported by NIST. The US Green Building Council was invited to review our study and they said, ah, we published the results and then they went to NIST and they said, we want that study taken off your website. And our goal wasn't to trash lead. It was just to point out, it's very important how you establish credit. You wanna be consistent. So looking at electricity, which is very important in terms of this transition, you know, we're about 20 renewable, 20 nuclear, 20 coal, 40 gas. So we're uh, about 40% carbon free, goal of 100% by 2035. You know, we need to accelerate deployment. We got to address variability. Um, you may have different views about nuclear, but I think it's important in terms of where we're at. Um, and one of the things we've modeled is embodied energy and um, or the energy to make renewable systems. And so there's this metric of electricity out versus non-renewable energy in. So for sustainability, what is a minimum condition of sustainability for this ratio? Right, it's gotta be greater than one, right? So we evaluated things like photovoltaics, where we look at the, you know, the energy to make the photovoltaic versus the electricity you get back. Here's the energy to make it, which you get back over 10 and 25 years in Detroit, Boulder, Phoenix. You could see we exceeded that because some people think you put more energy in than you get back. We looked at building integrated, where now you display shingles. We looked at the externality costs and you know, assign damage costs to the displaced pollution. We thought that was really gonna make, at the time, these photovoltaics more cost effective. It didn't at the time, but now you know, there's learning curves and we know that solar is very competitive. But we looked across you know, different technologies in terms of net energy ratio, and you know, the grid, the time is about 0.3. It's a bit higher than that, but clearly huge net energy ratio returns. Um, so investing non-renewable into these systems, you could really leverage um, and significant reductions in carbon. This was from our models, but NREL has a nice, you know, harmonized uh, set of data on carbon intensity of renewables. And then you got to look at other factors like area. So this is Michigan's electricity needs, and this is uh, land type in Michigan. This is how much willow you would need. Yellow is the ag land in the state, so you basically wipe out the ag land. There's wind, there's photovoltaics. So clearly we have challenges and need to recognize you know, needs in terms of land use with all this, which ties into where you site. And so we were looking at siting offshore Lake Michigan, simulated what people are willing to pay to push the turbines out of view um, and then evaluated damage costs, um, the view shed damage costs, but also the environmental benefits and did maps of where you could locate and site. But this has been really, there's a very strong voice of, I don't wanna see these turbines and have basically shut down projects. We don't have anything in Lake, you know, siting in Lake Michigan yet. So these are all challenges and, um, so I just wanted to, and where am I at? I'm okay. All right. I have a couple more slides after, but on education. But one of the things I want to just talk about, just to kind of conclude, and I had a concluding slide, which I could show on decarbonization across uh, buildings and mobility. But um, for those of you that are doing theses or pursuing PhDs, uh, very important in terms of starting out to, when you're defining your questions, really think about where's the opportunity in terms of high impact transformations. 
The other thing I found with students over the last 30 years is I love the enthusiasm with the ideas that they come. I want to do a thesis on X. And they're great ideas, but taking that idea and defining the problem and looking at the gap in the literature could take two years to get to where you could actually start to do modeling and do work. So it's really critical to build on a foundation of faculty knowledge and tools. Like these studies, we built upon Alyssa's work you know, to do the work on wireless charging and where to embed it and um, work on vehicles. And so very important to identify faculty members you want to work with, but look at, you know, their research and you want to build on it. And they know <clears throat> where work is going on and where there's opportunities in space. The other is in sustainable systems, you could see that you're integrating across tools and models. You know, I use Lifecycle as kind of my platform, but we gotta, you know, use models for congestion, traffic congestion, and you know, models for the grid and how that's evolving. Now, the good thing is NREL has the model, Cambian. You know, before we had to, had to do our own bottom up. Now we we use Cambian. We use Greet. Uh, we also know that there's problems in Greet. We got to correct because Greet, for example, looks at renewable looks at nuclear power <clears throat> and the primary energy out in electricity let's say is one they treat the primary energy that's used to make the nuclear electricity as one going in and there's a thermal cycle there so it's not one it's going to be like three to get one so we have to do a correction and it, you know we talked to them about their convention and anyway it's integrating these models, right? And that requires collaboration. Um, you need critical feedback. Don't, you, know, you want feedback, right? And um, we were talking about this last night. You know, you really need, you wanna find out what are the key drivers? What's, what's, where are the big impacts and which parameters are, are uh, sensitive in terms of affecting the results. And so you want to do scenario sensitivity and certainty to build robust models. And the other thing is communication skills. Um, I had, I talked about this modeler that I had, um, or this math modeling professor that I had was very influential. The other professor I had that was influential was an advisor, my advisor who was from MIT um, I learned about good technical writing. And uh, that, that is, is, is also so key. And I always sit down with the students and I say, okay, what is going to be the press release coming out of your research? Now, it doesn't always happen, but you know, think about how are you going to have an impact? You know, what, what is, where is your work going to go? And um, be prepared to communicate. Um, we just got this hydrogen award and, you know, I had to draft some quote for the you know press release and you just got to think about communicating your work effectively and if you want to affect change uh, accelerate that you could have great ideas but if you really want to accelerate the implementation and deployment of your ideas it's engaging with stakeholders in your research and they're going to be more receptive to actually taking your recommendations they actually i i was going to put that picture up but Alyssa's working on this bridge deck, right? It actually got deployed in Michigan. If you go to the airport, you're going under this deck and there's a picture of Alyssa with a hard hat on where they're pouring this actual ECC on the deck. That's because we're engaging with the DOT, right? Engaging with wholesome cement, the industry. Um, and, you know, it gets implemented. So I'm really... You know, you guys are in the right field here. This is the time. Um, you know, just the opportunities, everything from industrial ecology to economics to behavior, coming up with solutions, you are there. Um, and I, I am going to put up a recruitment slide, not to, not to pull the best students away, but some students want a different, unlike me, I stayed at Michigan my whole career, right? It's good to change, but 
I had family in the area and anything. Any, anyway, reasons. But we have a dual degree program uh, between engineering and our School for Environment Sustainability. It's like a two and a two and a half years for two degrees. Um, we also have joint PhDs. So Alyssa actually got a joint PhD in civil and environmental engineering and our School for Environment and Sustainability, right? But it's, it's really, I think interdisciplinary is a great thing. Now you don't have to do dual degrees and all that, but it's important to really look at that systems diagram with all the drivers and take courses in economics and take industrial ecology and, and you know, be able to communicate across, across disciplines. And just some information about our center. So if you are interested in hydrogen, for example, we got this grant. Let me know if you're interested in, uh, you know, potentially pursuing a doctorate. But of course, you got a great advisor here. Um, we have a cool fact sheet collection that we're just um, doing our next launch. We update it every year. We have 23 uh, fact, I'm sorry, 32 fact sheets with a lot of different facts and six minutes. I, I could take questions. I have a lot of other things, but I think I've given you enough. I don't want to overdo it, but maybe we could talk food at lunch, but uh, I'll stop here. Yeah. Two questions. I'll start at the first one. First one, you had mentioned about all this um, house impact uh, or even transportation impact. Have you looked into the role of incentives, like the new incentives of IRA, and how that changes adoption and, and possibly uh, changing the environmental impact? Yeah, so if we look at sort of our incumbent technology and systems, we've been optimizing with those. There's a lot of inertia and power to maintain status quo. Like we know that the oil and gas industry is very powerful and, you know, the price of gas goes up and then it goes back down. And um, so policy is required to overcome that inertia and get to efficiencies in terms of learning curves and, you know, bringing down costs and, and making systems more efficient. And so, yeah, that IRA is going to help. And they've estimated, I don't know how many billions of dollars of savings, you know, are going to be expected that those numbers have been worked out. I just don't recall what they were from that investment, you know, to make, to deal with, you know, solar and to deal with uh, efficiency of appliances and electric vehicles. So there's, and now they have a $4,000 tax credit for used electric vehicles, which could help potentially, yeah, right. So the, that all has a critical role because, and you know, the other side of it, we're not paying the full cost, right? The, there are the externalities from the emissions. And so you either put, a, you could put a price on those and if it's significant enough, you'll change behavior. But if you, it's tough to get those kinds of, you know, tax systems in place. So then the other side is you, you have incentives to bring down costs. So yes, it, it's critical. Um, now, we, we have not studied like, but there, there are studies and, and um, I, I could go to my notes from one of my classes that showed what the savings are expected, you know, from that, that investment. Now they're putting the money into hydrogen and, you know, we're looking at Hydrogen, like I said, it's strategic. You know, there's, you could see the fuel cell and is not efficient for light duty vehicles. They're looking at putting, you know, hydrogen in for power generation and storage. So again, you don't, what you look at, and I have had some slides, I knocked them out on, we've done work on storage and rules for storage. You wanna look at round trip efficiency is a critical metric. And round trip efficiency for hydrogen isn't great in terms of electricity for storage. Now, if you have 
wind that you're curtailing or solar that you're curtailing, yeah, make hydrogen. You know, don't just curtail it. Make hydrogen. But we have to really look at, you know, just overall efficiencies and in terms of these deployments and systems. Thank you. Uh, second question I had was on the public transport thing that, you know, I mean, I also am a big favor of public transport, but I also sometimes wonder about the infrastructure environmental impact. If had have they been studied? So we have a colleague, Alyssa and I have a colleague, Arpad Horvath uh, and Michael Chester, um, who's at Arizona, has modeled a lot of the infrastructure effects. So like the roads that Alyssa worked on, they looked at rail and the infrastructure. And there is a, you know, a cost for that, but it's going to be still much more efficient. If you go with systems that are with high occupancy, it's going to you know, do much better than what we're doing with, with these vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. The cost of public transportation is as well as how it's being related here. Is there communication that you go kind of near back to the public in terms of like dignifying the public transportation and public movement? I always try to talk about, in every single paper where we're talking, many papers where we're talking about vehicles, we talk about right sizing, we talk about mass transit, and you know, always are emphasizing those opportunities. And we, we talked about this VTOL. Um, it got a lot of press. This, um, you know, I knew it got a lot of press when, when this postdoc from China working with me brings up a, a paper uh, in Chinese and says, there's your name there. And, you know, they cited the study. But I talk about, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. We should, we got to invest in, you know, the transit and, uh, but yes, there, there's a, there is a stigma, you know, like on campus, not too many faculty ride the buses. You know, I ride the buses. I, it's, it's great. I could finish my lecture while I'm riding the bus instead of, you know, trying to drive between campuses and things. But we need to definitely be doing more on education. It, it's, it's all, you know, I talk about values. It's, it's cultural, like, right. What, what's the norm? You know, what are we creating in terms of norms? And we need to shift that. But I think it's really, you know, there's a movement, particularly with, with younger people, to, to change because you're seeing it. You know, gray hairs that aren't going to be around in 50 years when the, when the planet's, you know, cooked a few more degrees, hopefully not a few more. But, you know, there's an urgency, and I think, you know, you guys get it, younger people get it, and there's an opportunity to change, and, and change is happening. It's kind of great, great way to go. Uh, across the board, a lot of these topics, do we have time for behavior change, or we need to move to command and control? Which one will be more effective? <laughs> I mean, you're right. We, you know, we're, we're not moving fast enough. Right. And, you know, like China is is more command and control, like they put in huge, you know, investment in rail infrastructure. You, you know, you've been I think California. You, California has been a leader. Right. And, you know, you're trying to put in high speed rail and you're struggling and the rest of the country is not even close. Right. So. But that you have to work within the you know the system the the political system which is, is is unfortunately not in you know the most cooperative and yeah that, that's one thing that our young generation should help the politicians the decision makers to make more poor action and not wait for the small behavioral change to send you by the Heidi definitely definitely voting is 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 key. Yeah. I had two questions. One was, I noticed um, Dodge Newell and Tony Ream are both part of your faculty. Uh, and I read in particularly uh, Dodge Newell's uh, pieces on kind of critiquing LCA and the gaps on local populations and kind of the need to incorporate more environmental justice into that. 
uh, which when I was doing my QE oak, like, awesome, this is what I've been looking for, and then found it to be extremely difficult to actually do that, particularly for an environmental assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious if you collaborate with them and what oh, yeah. kind of how that has informed your approach. Um, and then my other question was when you're communicating, uh, what, how do you decide what to leave out? Uh, cause there's, you know, there's so much that goes into an LCA and I have a, also a hard right. time like getting to the point sometimes. Right. So for your first question, I've collaborated with both like Tony Reams. Um, there was a thesis student that I had and I actually suggested we bring in Tony and this was looking at Detroit and the energy burden in terms of heating your house. And so I was kind of helping on the energy analysis side and he was looking at really the, you know, the demographic and spatial analysis. And so that has informed me like this transportation energy burden. I suggested that and that was with Josh. Again, he is good with the GIS. He's a geographer and an industrial ecologist. But I, I brought in the GHG and the idea of the transportation energy burden metric came from the work with Tony on energy burdens for households with heating. So I thought, let's do that for so um it it has that has a big you know influence and and you know with Alyssa I got to you know meet a, a geologist or work with a geologist and you know we're doing you know some more work together but it's like having the opportunity to work across disciplines is huge and I think that in LCA and it's been for 20 years the next frontier is bringing in the social indicators but it is very difficult to do like megajoules you could add up ghgs you could add up if you look at you know you could look at jobs and you know you want employment or you don't want employment because it reduces cost and 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 you look at uh, um in in terms of Damage, how, how does that, how do you weigh that? Or um, even even just, this is not even social, but just the resource extraction. Like we don't have a good, good models for resource depletion and valuing that. But if you put on in terms of child labor or, or you know, unfairness in terms of the supply chain, very difficult. So, I mean, that is just, you could contribute there. There's, it's like wide open. It's like sort of where I was 30 years ago with LCA. You could do almost anything, you know, but it, it's, it's wide open, but it's not easy to, to come up with the metrics. Like I've seen, you know, Tony had a paper that, you know, talking about bringing justice into LCA with energy modeling. Conceptually good, but the actual operationalizing is, is tough. But you're in, you know, if that's your space, it's a good space. So there's a lot you could do. Yes. So uh, when you were talking with Basel and all the girls and your Latin and Latin, and I was wondering, like, could you, could you have, like, any study in getting that ones that the way you got to grid, and then you integrated that to so we're we have a study with Ford where we're we're looking at that right now, and so definitely that that is a service that you know this lightning could perform in terms of you know definitely um, because you you want to utilize your assets right like vehicles aren't used you know what ten percent of the time or less and they're parked and so um, now every time you discharge and charge you know you're affecting the battery life so you got to look at that which we did when we were looking at optimal charging of, of fleet vehicles we look at when you charge because that affects the pollution from the grid but then the cycling and how that affects the battery life and so but the other thing to recognize and and i've talked to Liz about this you you know, they set rules on the battery state of charge. 80% is kind of the threshold. But if you have 75% state, state of charge capacity on the battery, it's still useful. It's just you don't have 
you know, the same range. So anyway, it's that is that is an area in terms of addressing the variability intermittency of renewables. We're going to need to deal with, you know, storage and how to make a ro more robust, you know, grid. So I think that's going to play a role and we're going to have to, you know, change our behaviors in terms of when we use electricity as well.